finish the church at Laodicea this evening. We'll probably do that Sunday. Let's look at Galatians 5 and verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Our Father, we thank you for this time we have tonight. We pray you'd speak to us through your spirit, through your word. We pray that you'd help our young people in college and help those that are struggling with their health. We pray for our unsaved loved ones, especially, that they would come to know you as Savior. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking again at the fruit of the Spirit, which is goodness. Goodness, which is kindness, a love for the truth. And we're in the midst of considering how Christ did this looking at the cleansing of the temple, considering that he corrected the Pharisees, and now we're at the very last of the seven churches in Revelation as Jesus Christ himself appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos to inspire the book of Revelation. And so... Part of that is writing the seven letters to the seven churches. And we're looking at the church that needed to make up its mind, which is the church at Laodicea. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 14, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works that thou art neither hot nor cold, I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So we looked on Sunday. Remember, this is a letter written to the pastor of the church of the Laodiceans so that that pastor could read it to the congregation. And then this would be circulated throughout the other churches in the area. But it's specifically written to the church at Laodicea. This church was floundering and needed to make up its mind as to whether they wanted to be a church zealous for Christ or one that was no church at all. Some people like to play games, put on a pretense or a show of religion. But in the end, even if we fool people on earth, even to the end of our lives, God knows our hearts. And the best thing that we can do is be honest before God and each other and go the way that we choose. And so the options are, here, you know, be zealous for Christ, or don't be a church. Be zealous for Christ, or don't be a church, because there is no middle ground. You cannot, and I cannot, walk the fence of, well, I'm going to live for Christ today. I'm not going to tomorrow. Oh, I'll live for Christ today. I'm not going to tomorrow. Or I'll live for Jesus at home, but not in front of my friends. I live for Jesus at church, not in front of my family. No, that, that doesn't work with Christ. It doesn't work. So Sunday we considered three great reasons to choose Christ and follow him according to his word. One is that he is the amen, he says. He is the faithful one. He's faithful to us. How can we not seek to be faithful to him? He is the faithful and true witness. He is not just faithful in general as part of his essence or character, but this tells us that everything that comes out of his mouth is true, and he is faithful to do it so that we can say we have the inspired, preserved word of God. 
And then three, that Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. He is the creator God. He is not a created being. Everything comes forth from him. There has to be a source, folks. There has to be a source of where you and I came from. He is that source. No one created him. He just was. And so we considered those three things. Three great reasons to choose Christ. Now we're going to look at four great truths about lukewarm Christianity. And that will probably be the end of the outline. Four great truths about lukewarm Christianity. Now, we could argue night and day about what the hot or cold means. People say, well, I think we need to be hot. We need to be zealous and bold and hot for the Lord. Well, Jesus does not clarify here what the hot or the cold means. He just says, pick one. So we could argue about what the hot or the cold means, or we could just see it for what it is, and I believe it's just saying... Right here, as Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. He says, I wish you would make up your mind. I wish you would choose something. You ever have that? We've had that in our family, and I've been wishy-washy myself on some things. You ask the kids, what do you want for breakfast? Well, I don't know. What do you want for supper? Well, I don't know. Not that we really give a lot of choices there. Where do you want to go eat? What do you want to watch for a movie? Or on the TV? Well, this. Well, that. Or it could be the, uh, just pick something. <laughs> and that's all Christ is telling us. Make up your mind. I would thou were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So... Christ wants us to make a decision about ourselves. Will we determine to follow him or will we leave him? If you sit here tonight and me standing and say, I have decided to follow Jesus, then you better have decided to follow Jesus. Me too. Because if we don't, if we just flip flop like most of Christianity does today, it's no good. It's a disgusting thing in the sight of God. We need to make up our mind. We said to Christ when we accepted him as Savior, I have decided to follow Jesus. And to go back on that is no good. We decide to follow him or to leave him. We decide... Uh, these things, either way, we need to stop playing games, make decision because God knows what our hearts are anyway. So the first thing we'll look at of these four great truths, and this is all the further we're going to get tonight, is that it discussed Jesus Christ. Four great truths are about lukewarm Christianity. Number one is it discussed Jesus Christ. How do you know that it discussed Jesus? He says, well, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. And if you were to look at what that means, it means not to get disgusting, but it literally means to vomit. I will throw you up. Now, when do you throw up? You throw up when you don't feel well, when your stomach is upset, generally. Some people throw up spontaneously. That's not normal. Generally, your stomach's upset, and your breakfast, lunch, or supper, or all three come back up. And so Jesus is saying this about this lukewarm Christianity. It makes me sick. Can you imagine him looking at what we have today? People floundering back and forth, doing all that they do in the name of Christ. And imagine how sick it makes him. The true Bible Christianity requires deciding to follow Christ, putting him first because he is worth it, not our family, friends, or otherwise. And others clearly know which we prioritize because of our actions. Throughout his ministry, Christ repeatedly called to others to make a choice about him. 
despite the soft gospel that's been put forth over the years, the expectation of dedication has not changed. Jesus expects us to follow him. Let's look at a few things this evening. This, again, this is all we'll look at. Look at Matthew chapter 8, if you would, please. Repeatedly throughout his ministry, Jesus calls to the masses, looks at his disciples, and says, hey, you want to follow me, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you your very life, and not necessarily that you will be martyred, but it's going to require you to lay down your life and follow me. Matthew chapter 8, verse number 18. The Bible says, Now when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart unto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus saith unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. Say, so why did Jesus say certain things like this? and more that we'll look at later. He says it to prove our hearts. We do not serve and follow Christ on our terms. That's what most people want, though. That's why man-made religion is so popular. Catholics, Mormons, Jehovah's Witness, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, paganism in general. It's why man-made religion is so popular. It benefits you in some way that appeals to the flesh. Islam, for instance, is a religion that has a gang mentality. It's very, very popular in the jails. I know this. I've worked in the jails, as you know. And you have people in the jails, new people that come in. The Muslims will come to them and say, if you will turn to Islam, if you will convert to Islam, we'll protect you. Oh, that's, that's pretty, you know. If I weren't saved, that would appeal pretty well because you got people coming up saying, I'll protect you. It won't cost you anything except you've got to turn to my religion. It's got a gang mentality. You leave our buddy alone or we'll beat you up. Now, some of, some of so-called Christianity has that mentality too, but it's incorrect. It's incorrect. Man-made religion appeals to the flesh in some way. Catholicism says, hey, you pay us. You do this so many times. You go and you confess your sins to the priest who isn't going to tell anyone. They take that very seriously. And you can maybe possibly have your sins absolved. You can maybe possibly go to heaven. Well, sure, that appeals to the flesh. I can get some things off my chest by confessing to the priest. I can pay them money. I can basically buy God off. And if none of that works for you, then most of the time today, you can just go and make up your own religion. Make up something that does appeal to you. That's not how God works. God says, here's my word. It says you're a sinner. It says the only way... To have sins forgiven is to trust in my son who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross, rose from the dead. You must accept his person and work and then to prove you believe, follow him. That doesn't appeal to the flesh much at all. You think Jesus looking at this scribe saying, hey, and the first thing, Hey, if you follow me, you've got to give up your luxuries. You think that appeals to the flesh? And by the way, it's very consistent with the message of Scripture. Remember Ephesians 5 that says we're not to live profligate, luxurious lives? 
We're not to live in the lap of luxury. Yet, what do many, I'm not going to say congregations, it's encouraged of congregations because the preachers, the ministers, live that way themselves. And the congregations feed it. And he tickles the congregation's ears so that they'll continue that way. But that's against scripture. Luxurious living. Going and having all these very expensive things. We're to live simply and humbly on this earth. We're not to be gathering hordes of treasures about us and walking about in the world looking like we have a ton of money. That's not for Christians. Jesus says he warns the pampered that they would have to give up their luxuries. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. By the way, he practiced what he preached. This is God made flesh. If anyone deserved luxury, it would be him. Are you prepared to set aside, I'm not saying it's wrong to save money, not saying that, that at all, not saying it's wrong to have a house or have a car, it's wrong to have a luxurious house or car. You say, well, what does that entail? More than you need. If you are going about to try to make a statement to the world, look at me, then it's wrong because we're to live modest lives. Are you prepared to lay those things aside to follow Jesus? You say, well, what if I make a lot of money with what I do? What if I come into great sums of money? Well, the Bible tells you what to do with that. The Bible tells you what to do with that. There's opportunities that come to minister to other people. There's opportunities to pay off debts for yourself opportunities to save up for things in the future, things like that, not to go on a luxury vacation. It's not wrong to go on vacation, though. There's a balance that we seek to achieve in life, right? Number two, he warned the grieving that they would have to give up their customs. Verse number 21, and another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me to first go and bury my father. Now, we would think that this is pretty reasonable right the guy's father just passed away but Jesus has a lesson to teach here he says follow me and let the dead bury their dead if you're going to follow Christ if you're going to do his will there will come times where you may have to avoid certain customs for certain reasons if you should go into the ministry or maybe not if you just work a secular job and God's will leads you away from where you live. But especially the ministry. <laughs> I mean, my wife said goodbye to her grandparents before going to college because there was not enough money. Back 20 years ago, there was not enough money or the, really the technology or time or what have you to get her home if her grandparents passed away. There are times missionaries have to say goodbye to their elderly loved ones before they go on the mission field, knowing that is part of the ministry. There are sacrifices that are made like that. Sometimes you have to look at a family member that's marrying into an ungodly marriage and you have to say, no, I'm not going to attend that. I'm sorry, I love you, but I don't agree with what you're doing because it's not God's will. I'm not going to be there to support that. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to give up our customs, our traditions, our habits. And we have to look outside those things. And by the way, we all have them. America has them. 
Tennessee has them, your family has them. <laughs> and we have to consider everything, weigh it against the scripture, and if it doesn't line up with the Bible, say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do that. Somebody has a party, maybe it's an anniversary party, at a place where they're going to be serving alcohol and you know people are going to be drinking it up. And you say, I'm sorry, I can't go there. Can't do that. Won't do that because it doesn't please the Lord. And that's got to be at the foundation of everything. Does it please Christ? Not does it please auntie or uncle? Does it please mom or dad, sister or brother? But does it please Christ? He warned the grieving they would have to give up their customs. Number three, he warned us that we would have to put him above our family and friends. This is the most recognizable as we've studied this in Luke. But look at Matthew 10, if you would please, verse 34. Jesus says, think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I, am, I came not to send peace but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be, shall be they of his own household. Are you willing to follow Christ despite who it offends? Because it can't be that we follow him in church here. Here there is no, or there should be, and I, I work hard to keep it this way, but here there is to be no adversity. No adversity. Here it should be easy to be a Christian, right? You should be able to come through the doors and sit down and say, I know that what I hear is going to be of the word of God. I know I'm going to be around people that love me or praying for me will help me if I need it. That's, that's what church is to be, a family. Indeed, right? So here it should be easy to be a Christian. You have people that will encourage you to be a Christian. You go out into the world, it's not going to be easy. We're promised adversity and we need to determine if, if we're saved and if we're going to follow Christ, we need to determine not to just be Christians here where it's easy, be Christians out there where it's hard. You've heard me say recently that there, Sarah and I had to talk about this. We talked about it in our family. I mentioned it here, that there's no good Bible college that does everything 100% correctly. You have to kind of like with political candidates, you have to look for what is the best, what is the best that can be dealt with. You have things like where Phoebe is, where they say, oh yeah, we use the King James, but then they, you find out they really don't care about that and there's not much you can do. So you teach and we ask Phoebe, are you okay? And she says, oh yeah, I'm fine. Because I get all upset about it. And I told her, I said, it's just because you're my daughter and I expect everything to be 100% on point for you because you're worth it. <laughs> and I just have to settle down. <laughs> but still it's you have to be able to look and say yeah i can handle this and that's what church is to prepare us for it's what discipleships to prepare us for it's what a daily devotional life prepares us for because folks there's a world out there that hates your savior and mine and thus will hate you and it will come out at times they are in your family. They are at your workplace. It's just the truth of the matter. We have to be prepared for it. And Jesus is telling these people that right here. He says, hey, I, I didn't come 
to create flower wreaths, put them around everybody's head, join hands, sing kumbaya. He said, I came with a sword. I came to cause division. He said, well, that's not the Jesus that I've heard about. Well, this is the Jesus that loves truth, and the world loves darkness rather than light. It naturally attracts the world, darkness, whereas light naturally attracts us. So he tells these people in verse 37, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Are you willing to put Christ above? Should it come to it? And it will at some point in your life. I practically guarantee it. Are you willing to put Christ above your family and friends? When family member X or friend Y or coworker Z does these things that are against scripture, are you willing to say no? I'm sorry, can't do that, can't be a part of it, won't be a part of it, won't giggle at it, won't laugh at it. Instead, I'm going to walk away from it and get away from it if I can. Are you willing to sacrifice relationships with those people to keep your relationship with Christ? If If it comes to that, what if someone says, well, you be at that, you be at that wedding or that's the last time you'll ever hear from me. You say, well, it's an ungodly wedding. I can't. I'm sorry. There are people like that out there. They do exist. Folks, it has to be Christ first. If you and I say that we're Christians, it has to be Christ first first. That's what the church at Laodicea was waffling about. Well, I'm a Christian one second, then I'm not the next. I'm a Christian one second, I'm not. Now the world loves that. On one side, the world scorns it because they they know that those people are basically fakes. But on the other side, they love it because they can just feed their flesh off of that. Hey, I mean, if the world can go to a church and sing ungodly music and hear ungodly preaching and be around ungodly people and they still call it a church and the world get good vibes off that, they're going to do it. And they do. They do. Who are we going to put first? It's going to require sacrifice. But it's going to be worth it. He warned us that we would have to give up our comfort, verse number 38. He that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Are you willing to give up your comforts? We talked about giving up your luxuries. Are you willing, should it be required of you to give up your comforts? Carrying a cross isn't very comfortable. Being attached to one, even less so. But if it's required of you, are you willing? Are you willing to be, uh, have your place of living upset and have to go live somewhere else? Are you willing to have trials and troubles come your way, health problems, various other issues that God allows to teach us to be more like Jesus? Are you willing to live that way, to give up your comfort? I will say again, in America, we are very focused on comfort, aren't we? Pleasure and comfort. Jesus, Jesus says you need to give that up. Verse number 39 says, He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He warned us we'd have to give up our dreams. Many of our dreams are born of 
ambition of the flesh. It's not wrong to have dreams. It's not wrong to live in a comfortable bed at night either and have a comfortable pillow and get a good night's sleep. There's nothing wrong with those things. What is wrong is if we will not follow Christ and give those things up if it's required. It's not wrong to have dreams. Just make sure your dreams line up with God's will. You say, well, I dream of having that very expensive car. Why? Why? Why, why do you want your car insurance to skyrocket? Why do you want your car mechanic bills to skyrocket if something happens to the car? Oh, nothing will happen to that car. Don't tell me nothing will happen to a car. With cars, just like with homes, it's not if it breaks, it's when it breaks and what breaks. Just like our bodies, it's not when we get, or if we will get sick next, it's when. Now, it might be years and years, it might be months and months, or it might be days and days. We don't know. But don't say it'll never happen. We don't know that. That's foolish talking. Say, so Why do you want that? luxurious car. Why do you need that $100,000 uh, Shelby Cobra? Why do you need that? Well, I think it would be cool to get it fixed up and then I'll resell it. Okay, that's, that's actually a legitimate thing to say. But, well, I want to go fast. Um, where are you going to go fast? Are you going to be like the genius? We followed down the W road that passed people in the w, double yellow lines. No, that is illegal against the law. Endangering people, that is wrong. Well, I want to go fast on a, a car ra racetrack. Okay, fine. <laughs> but no one ever says that. They want to go fast on a back road somewhere, hop hills, and endanger their lives. Why are you shaking your head? I was on the racetrack. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's just one example. People say, well, I need a luxurious house. Why do you need a house with more rooms than you need? You still have to heat those rooms and cool those rooms and run that heat and air. You still have to pay the government tax on that, the property tax, you still have to keep up all those. Why? Why not just live simply? Most people say, well, I want my neighbors to know just how much I think I have. Well, that's not a good reason. It's not a good reason. People say, well, I have a dream of doing this. Was well, it a reasonable dream? I want to jump out of a perfectly good airplane. No, that's not a reasonable dream. I want to climb a perfectly good cliff face <laughs> and pray I don't fall off. That's not really a good dream. I want to be a rocket scientist, but I don't have the capacity to learn rocket science. That's not a good dream. Right? We even go so far today as men say, well, I want to have babies. Well, if you're a man, you can't have babies. It's not a good dream. We have to make sure our dreams line up with Scripture. You know, the biggest dream, I, I think, in my opinion, take it for what it's worth, but this is what I see out in the world, one of the biggest dreams that people are not willing to give up today, besides the luxurious things, is women and their careers. Right? My dream is to have a career and make something of myself and show everyone who I am and on and on and on. That's just ambition. And when they have children, they say, I shouldn't have to, how many times do you see this? I shouldn't have to give up on my dreams and raise these children. Well, if I were the children of that person, I'd say, thanks, Mom. <laughs> because she's just then saying, my children are not important. 
And that's how the world treats children, as throwaways. They throw them away to the TV if they don't abort them, throw them away to the TV, throw them away to the government, throw them away, throw them away, throw them away. Yes, I get passionate about that. When the Bible says that one of the greatest things a lady can do is teach her children, raise her children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, with the husband leading the home, of course. But the mothers, the, the women are to keep the, they're to keep the home. Take care of the things in the home. We have to make sure our dreams line up with scripture. When they do, God's happy. We tend to be happier, more content. But most people don't want to live that way anymore. He that findeth his life shall lose it. Oh, you can go out and make something of yourself. You can make your fortune. Know this, though. Most people say that if you make a fortune, it's because you compromised and corrupted yourself somewhere. In other words, Bill Gates didn't make his fortune off of pure, sinless decisions. We'll just leave it at that. You can do those things, but you will compromise at some point. He that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You and I are so much better off just saying, Jesus, here's my dreams, but you, you ultimately tell me what I should do with my life. You ultimately give me the opportunities or lack thereof. You ultimately do these things. Order my life for me because, as Solomon said, I'm but a child. I know not how to go out or to come in. And God does know what's best for us. He warned us that there was no room to look back. Look at Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 62. Actually look back at verse number 61. This is very similar to what Matthew 8 put forth, just adding this little bit. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And the lesson Jesus had says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There's no room to look back. Why did Jesus say this? I believe it's akin to what you find in Genesis, where Abraham's servant went to look for a wife for Isaac. If you were to read that story, you would find that Rebecca rightly did go back to her household. And the servant went back, explained everything, and they agreed to let Rebecca go. And Rebecca willingly went with the servant. But, but, Rebecca's family tried to stall the servant. And the servant would not be stalled. He said, no, I, I've got a work to do. Let me go do it. There's another story in the book of Judges where a man stayed with someone and the man stalled him. And that man allowed himself to be stalled and he had to work to do, but he allowed himself to be stalled and stalled and stalled, and great trouble came of that. So imagine this man going back to his family and saying, I'm going to follow Christ. His family could have changed his mind and said, no, you, you have responsibilities here. You need to do this instead when he was to follow Christ. Now, if you choose to follow Jesus, let no one sway you. And if you truly are saved, you will let no one sway you either. 
That's what this means in verse 62. You've chosen a work. You've chosen a path for yourself. You've chosen someone to follow. You've chosen a foundation for your life, a, a book that you will live your life based off of. Let no one turn you back from it. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. There is no room for glancing back and saying, and I do this too and I have to catch myself. There's no room at looking back and saying, I wish I would have. I wish I would have. I wish I would have. No, we follow Christ according to his word the best we know how with the knowledge that we have at that time. We keep going forward. We keep learning and growing. That's the Christian walk. And eventually we end up at the end of the work having learned what God would have us to learn. Having done, hopefully, what God would have had us have us to do. There's no room to look back. If you say, oh, I wish I would have made this choice and I could have made so much more money. No, no, it's not about money, it's about Christ. Christ can take care of the money. I wish I would have gone to this place or that place. I find myself wishing sometimes, I wish I never went to the college I went to. Well, I never would have met my wife, probably. So I can't wish that especially. You don't look back. You say, why did you go to Crown College? I went because of the knowledge I had at that time. Same with my wife. She went because of the knowledge she had at that time. And we had desperately little knowledge. <laughs> but we went with what we had at that time. My pastor said, go there. And I learned to, and have learned over the years, do what the pastor recommends. God will bless you for it. God has and did. That's all you can do sometimes. That's why in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. That's why my wife and I, from the things that we've learned, we seek to impart them to you all so that you have greater wisdom going into things than we did. And don't make the mistakes that we did. And I praise God that so far, the kids in college aren't making those mistakes. And that's all we can do. But there's no, no room to look back. And so I, never, I wish I never would have done this. Did, were you following Jesus? Well, as, as far as I know, with the knowledge I had, then just let it rest. I wish I never would have followed Jesus. Why? Well, I wouldn't have this problem. Well, you don't know that. <laughs> you don't know that. My family would like me more. You don't know that. Don't what if it, don't look back. Follow Christ, he's worth it. Next, he warned us to focus on following him. And this is akin to Luke 9, 62. Look at John 21 and verse 22. John 21 and verse 22. Here you have the incident where Peter and most of the rest of the disciples left the ministry. Jesus had to go bring them back in because they went back to fishing. Jesus had to sit down with Peter and say, Simon, do you love me? <laughs> Getting to the heart of the matter, Simon, do you love me? Simon, do you love me? And once all that settled, Peter and Jesus are walking together. And he says in verse number 20, Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Okay, so they're walking and John, for some reasons, following them. 
Peter, seeing him, saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? And Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Literally, he says, What do you care, Peter? You focus on following me. You follow me for yourself. What God has for my son, he does not have for my daughter. He does not have for Sarah. He does not have for Heather. He does not have for Pat. He does not have for my wife or me. He may have similar things as part of his will for all of us. But we each have to determine to follow God for ourselves. That's one of the great mistakes I've made. I tried to be like Paul Chapel, tried to be like Clarence Sexton, tried to be like Temple Baptist Church, tried to be like this, tried to be like that, tried to be like the other. That's not wrong to adopt some best practices, but you have to be your own person. Be your own person. Find out who you are. I'm not talking about go on some soul-seeking adventure on a mountain where you sit and meditate and contemplate the universe. Find out who you are. What does it mean to be James or Andrea or Sarah or Heather or Pat or the other Sarah, which is the first Sarah, or Sarah the first, Sarah the second. <laughs> what does that mean? Or are you just someone's puppet? There's a lot of people that are just someone's puppet. They don't know who they are. They don't know what they're capable of. That's why, that's one huge reason, you, if you were to say, why did you send your daughter and why did you recommend to Matthew to go away five and six hours away? Why did you recommend that? So they could get away. So they could find out who they were. So they could thrive, struggle, whatever they're going to do, so that they could be on their own, though with contacts and help, but they could be themselves without mom and dad around, sister, brother sometimes around. Andrea says, well, I'm going to go be with Phoebe at college. Yes, that's fine. I'm not talking about that. Not talking about that. They can be themselves. Why do we encourage them to go get a job off the mountain? Why don't I groom Jimmy to be the assistant pastor of the church, as many ministers do? Because these kids need to be themselves. They need to interact with the world, interact with their peers, interact with people that aren't us at times. They need to find out what God's will is for their lives. There are some things I can say for sure is God's will. There are some things I can't say. Like, I can't look at Matthew and say, it's God's will for you to be an engineer. Or, or it's God's will for you to be in IT or in uh, security or whatever. I can't say that. I can ask questions and receive answers. I can give observations, but I can't say with 100% certainty what God's will is there. Jimmy can tell me I love breaking apart computers and putting them back together and doing this, that, and the other. Andrea can say I love numbers and pushing buttons. I love baking. I love Winnie the Pooh. You smash all that together, I don't know what you get, but we figure it out little by little. But ultimately, they figure it out. And they become the ones with the drive. And they say, by God's grace, by faith, I believe this is his will. We have to focus on following him, not trying to be other people. Being what God has made us to be for his glory. Because he has, he has made us not to float around and to 
uh, be bums and hobos mooching off society like so many people do today. He has not created us to do that. He created us to do something for him, for his glory. And that is special. Focus on following him. And he warned us not to be wishy-washy about these things. What thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Right? I probably misquoted and paraphrased that, but you get the gist. Whatever you find to do, do it. Whatever you believe God wants you to do, go for it. As long as it's not sinful or immoral or illegal. Don't be wishy-washy about it. Now, if you run up against a stone wall and you say, this just isn't working out, well, it's either a trial that God's bringing your way to see if you'll stick it out, or he's saying you need to shift gears and find out what I really have for you. He does open doors that no man can shut, and he does close doors that no man can open as we walk by faith. But James chapter 1, we'll finish with this in verse number 2. Don't be wishy-washy about it. You seek wisdom, God, God's not going to give you anything different than his word. If you seek wisdom, he's not going to send you an email, he's not going to send you a memo, he's not going to give you a vision. He's going to give you his word. And once you find out what his word says, go for it. He says, my brother, count it all joy in verse number two, chapter one, when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. And I will say with that, a good chunk of the Christian walk is learning to be patient, not running ahead of God, not forcing your way into situations, rhino charging your way through, things like that. No, be patient. There's nothing lost in patience and everything gained. There's much to be lost in rushing. Much to be lost in rushing. Let patience have her perfect work that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's the type of person that makes Jesus sick. If we're going to follow Christ, we need to do it. If we make the decision to please Christ, we need to take that direction. No matter the consequences, no matter what family and friends say, no matter what society thinks of us, you and I are not in this for the popularity contest. If you are out for your life to please people, you will not do well in the Christian walk because it is not about pleasing people, it is about pleasing God. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He likes, as we've been talking about, laughing about lately, I brought out the sparkly shiny. The double-minded man likes the sparkly shiny. He hops from this to that to the other, from this job to that job to the other. I have family that does that. Some people from this spouse to that spouse to the other. Some people from this house to that house to the other. Oh, this is God's will. Then this is, people do it with churches. This is God's will. And this is God's will. And this is God. Like God's constantly changing his mind. I know ministers that do that with churches. We have to be careful because it makes Jesus sick. We don't want to be the wishy-washy 
Christian. We don't want to follow lukewarm Christianity. We have to choose to be hot, choose to be cold. Father, I pray you take these things this evening help us. Well, thank you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Any prayer requests tonight?